about one person in 20 of both sexes is homosexual. Contrary to popular opinion, most of them don't look any different from anyone else. People can only tell the obvious ones, but they are a tiny minority. Mr Moby, do you think homosexuals should be sent to prison? Yes. I was beaten up in a public lavatory and left lying on the floor. It was all rather messy and rather nasty, I'm afraid. I think one of the barriers to accept public acceptance for you is that normal people, or most normal people, find what you physically do disgusting. Uh, this is a dealing with a twilight area of abnormal people, and, um, and it's something that I don't oh. think is out for, for public discussion. For many of us, this is revolting, men dancing with men. Homosexuals in this country today break the law. Most homosexuals must lead a secret, dark existence. Imagine being arrested for kissing the one you love. Imagine losing your job and home for holding your lover's hand. Imagine being publicly shamed for simply being who you are. That's not a story from a movie. That was real life for gay men living here in the UK 50 years ago. In 1967, homosexuality was partially decriminalized in England and Wales. But even still, the police and the state continued to hunt down gay men. It was a time of fear, shame, lost love, but also excitement and pure gay joy. Today we meet some of the men who lived through that time and hear their incredible stories. When was the first time that you realised that you were a little bit different? Um, I think I was 12 before I finally realised what's going on and how I was attracted to boys my age. I guess when I fell in love with, um, I was in the second grade with, with uh, Lon Connor. God, he was good looking. But realising that it was very deep and it was very real and it was something that was absorbing me. Was he a teacher? No, he was another boy. He was a little boy. I thought, he's good looking. I like him. It was something I knew that wasn't to be talked about, but to be gay. I mean, coming from a Catholic family. Uh, I was being bullied at school, both physically and mentally, as it were, being called queer, poofter, and all these sorts of things. It was a gang that were very close together and recognised there was something different about me. But I was different enough from them for them to target me, for them to rough me up. About that time, um, you started to have in the papers the stories of homosexuals who were being prosecuted for being homosexual and things started to click and thought oh I'm one of them exactly did you speak to anyone about it no there was no one to speak to about it really my mother wouldn't have understood anyway because in the 40s um, her reference to anyone gay was they were a pansy boy and she would she did say once I hope you're not going to turn out to be one of those uh, you live with that knowledge of course that you were in effect the way you felt was illegal. What does that do to a young man's head? It screws it up. I mean, you know, because you're internalizing it. Um, as a result, it caused me depression. Uh, still to this day, I have bouts of depression. It's because of your keeping all of those sort of things inside you the whole time. By about the age of 15, I had quite a close friend at school as well. And uh, he felt the same way. Um, you think he was gay? Oh, yes. What was his name? Richard. He also had great difficulty in accepting his difference. He often used to say, why can't I be normal? And sadly, at the age of 15, uh, he died. The story goes that he fell off a cliff. Knowing him, I don't think he was the sort of individual who would fall off a cliff. And I think he threw himself off. He committed suicide. So. You can imagine when I learnt of that, I was devastated. He was the one person you could confide in. Mm. But it did, it knocked me back. And at the age of 16, I then tried to commit suicide. I wanted to be normal, um, yet I knew I wasn't. What was your mom's feeling towards gay people? Did you ever see oh, her? Oh, she, she was so bigoted. She didn't like blacks, she didn't like Chicanos, she didn't like gays. Even so, 
she was so dependent on them, particularly gays, because they did her hair, they helped her with her makeup, did her clothes, all that kind of stuff. So she loved all that, but she ran them down. There was a time where I had someone staying with me, and she used to come once a week to do the cleaning. She insisted on coming once a week. I hated her coming to do the cleaning. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> hated it, but this woman wouldn't let, let go of me. She was taking, driving me to school one day, and... Um, she was going on about her hairdresser, this and that. She was, oh, he is so gay, he would have to squat to pee. I said, mother! She said, what? I said, mother, some of my best friends are gay, and I'm gay. And she was like, almost right to the car. She said, my God, how can you do this to me? And I said, do it to you, I'm doing it for me, not you. And she said, you're so hysterical. And I said, who's hysterical? You're hysterical. We had this big row in the car. It was a pleasure to leave it and go to school. So she was upstairs one day and she called me and said, Tony, I said, yes. She said, where is David sleeping? Because the spare bed doesn't appear to have been slept in. Are you sleeping with him? So I said to her, it's none of your business. You've never spoken to me about your private life. I'm not going to speak to you about mine. And then what happened? Nothing. She ignored it. She never mentioned it again. I was 24 when the 1967 Act came in. And even then, of course, it was far from easy. It came with terms and conditions, didn't Exactly. It? You had to be 21. Sexual activity could only take place in a private premises. So if, for example, you were with someone and there was someone else in the same house, albeit in a different room, it was illegal. It couldn't be a hotel or a rented no, no, property. Oh, no, 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 no way. You had to own the house. Yep, yep. Uh, window blinds had to be closed. Yes. Doors had to be locked. Yes, yes. The 67 Act didn't change things. I mean, if anything, things became worse. It went from a point where we were left alone, more or less, to we were being intensely pursued. I started to discover there were what we would refer to as cottages, public conveniences in remote locations where you could go and meet other men that were looking for sex. It started a long involvement with cottaging. It became an obsession. But was it love that you were searching for? Yes, yes, couldn't... yes. The, the, the sex was hopefully going to be something that would lead to, to love between me and another man. But what I discovered was that most of the men I encountered were pretty closeted anyway. They didn't even want to have a conversation. And they certainly didn't want to see me again. They wanted to do what they were there to do with me and leave. It made me feel depressed. It made me feel, well, I'm not getting anywhere. The police in those days were very active. They didn't like groups of homosexuals being together. So they were forever raiding bars. And they used to send out what we used to call the pretty boys. You're not the first one to talk about these pretty boys, yeah. these policemen. Yeah, and some of them were. The agent provocateurs deliberately trying to lure you, in. lure you in. Because the idea was you'd come on to them or they would encourage you to come on to them, at which point they'd arrest you. Was there a fear when you were going to meet these men searching for love, having sex, that you were going to get caught by the police? Yeah, and that was part of the excitement, that high Oh, the excitement. Yeah, because I knew there was, I was doing something that I could be uh, arrested for. I knew that it was something that I could be uh, uh, used as a target for because there were people that used to come to, to cottages to beat people up. It didn't stop me. It's not that I wanted to be arrested. It's not that I wanted to get into any trouble. It's just that it went with the territory. So I learned some skills about how to protect myself. At any point, did it get you into trouble? Yes, it did. It did? It did. I think it was in my early 20s. I was in Piccadilly Underground in the toilets. But I think the mistake I made was to switch stalls, not just go into one stall and then leave. Oh no, that wasn't enough for me. I had to carry on, didn't I? They had constructed um, a screen at one end and behind that there was a camera and people observing what was going on. So at, one, at some point, one of them came round and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're being arrested. I was arrested 
or importuning. What went through your head? Well, complete fear, you know, thinking, oh my God, it's, it's a thing I've been trying to avoid has finally happened. But also a bit of anger, which I did express to them. I wasn't doing anything compared to what I'd done before. I was being arrested for just looking. I was taken to the police station, which wasn't very far away, and I was told, plead guilty. Because if you plead guilty, it will all be over very quickly, and you'll probably just be fined. If you don't plead guilty, the proceedings will be recorded and it will get into the newspaper. This is easier for you just to admit it's happened. And no one will know. That's what they told me. But it didn't turn out that way because there was a reporter from the local press in the gallery who wrote a report about it with my name and address. As a result of that, my landlord said to me that I don't want people like you in one of my properties. You're out. Did you ever receive an apology? No. From whom? The police? The state? No. No, I haven't. Would you but accept then what, what good would that do? Was there a pressure from your family to get married? My mother in particular put pressure on me uh, for a good number of years. What's wrong with you? Why haven't you got any girlfriends? I went to a party and this girl was there. I mean, she was much, my, much the same age. So I think by that time I was thinking, well, perhaps if I tried going out with a woman, things would change. You know, you go through those sort of motions in your mind. That you could trick yourself into being yes. straight. Yes. So in a weak moment, I said yes. And uh, on the eve of the wedding, uh, or the night, you know, before the wedding, I didn't sleep. My plan was that, okay, I'll stick with this for two or three years and then say, sorry, it hasn't worked out, you know, divorce. I think I only had sex about twice with her. Um, you had sex twice in how many years? 27 years. Twice in 27 years. Yeah. Throughout that period, as I say, I led a double life. Were you ever worried that it would get back to her? Well, if it does, so what? I'm off the hook. Exactly, yes. When my son finished university, left home, and as soon as he had, I then sat her down and said, I'm sorry, but I can't continue like this any longer. And I was quite honest with her. I said, look, I've struggled with my sexuality for most of my life. Her response was, I'm not surprised. So she obviously had picked up something. Did you feel guilty? No. Nothing? No. No, I, I, I felt relieved, quite honestly. My next worry was how do I tell my son because we were very close and he sat there and said so what dad I don't mind you're still my dad I don't care how did that feel hearing that from oh, your it own was son? wonderful absolutely wonderful in 1999 I met my partner Jeff we both immediately sort of clicked as you say and that was 17 years ago now happily ever after I hope at what point did you find love oh I love <laughs> I loved him more than anybody. But the problem was, I was very out and he wasn't. He couldn't be. But when, when we broke up, um, we were surrounded by people, men and women, and uh, chatting in this pub. And he said, look, I don't think I'm gay. And so I'm not going to go on with this relationship. And I got so angry. And so I stood up and I said, you're not gay? You don't think you're gay? I will give you a certificate. You are gay. And I walked out. I can't believe I did that. That was horrible. He turned bright red and everyone looked at him. Well, of course, it was over forever. It took me a long, long, long time to process that. Your hopes for future love now that that's over. Of course. I mean, I'm always looking for Mr. Wright. You still are now? Not actively, but I presume he'll come. <laughs> <laughs> He'll walk on in. I live in expectation, honey. I hadn't been on the gay scene. I didn't know any gay bars. I thought, how do I find other people? I'll buy a copy of Gay News. I bought a copy, the only copy I've ever bought. And the advert says, London, 58, smooth, slim, caring, seeks slim, active partner, middle years, one-to-one -one relationship only. So I answered. Got a reply within a week. And how long were you together in total? In total, it was nearly 28 years. One thing I stipulated was that um, I'm not moving in until you get a washing machine. 
Bridezilla over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were those differences, which I think really enhanced the relationship. And then he got sick. Yeah, it, um, it happened quite quickly. He was, uh, he was 86 by that time. One morning, um, I woke him up and um, I could tell he had fluid on his lungs. And uh, I rang the ambulance. And they said that the next 24 hours are critical. Got him settled in the ward. So I was away about an hour and a half. Got back to the hospital and I couldn't understand what he was saying. Things obviously were going at a very fast rate and like looking at monitors and thinking these numbers don't look good. And um, so from, from calling the ambulance, 10 hours later he was dead. Did you say goodbye to him? Yes, but he wasn't aware of it by then. Because it's only since he's died that I've realised how deeply, you know, emotionally we were involved. <laughs> this is, sounds like an amazing bond and relationship the two of you have. Well, I think the fact that, as I said, it was a slow burner, that we slowly got to know each other, got to appreciate each other, that um, gave you that strength. Do, do you think that you'll love again? <sighs> Not to any the same degree, no. Do you think he'd want you to? Yes. One of the things he said about a day or so before you died, he said, get on your computer and find someone who can, uh, who can look after your needs. And it was such a shock to me that he just came out with it. And I just thought, oh, well, you know, where's that come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you ever wish that you were straight? No, I've never wished that. There was a point I became very depressed. And I thought, this isn't working well for me. I'm spending so much time in this endless search for someone that I don't seem to be able to find, and yet I can't seem to stop. So I went to my GP and I said, I've got these deep periods of depression, I'm losing interest in living, and I think it's because I'm gay. And he said, well, I'll refer you to a psychologist in a hospital, which he did. I went to see the psychologist who said, we can help you. I said, you can? Oh yes, he said. I said, well, how can you help me? He said, we'll give you aversion therapy. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, what we do, we attach electrodes to your genitals and we show you pictures of nude men and if you get an erection, you're given an electric shock. I couldn't quite believe what he was saying. I thought, this is bizarre. That's not going to work. I said, no, thank you. Bye. <laughs> yeah, I think in a way that was my standing my ground and saying, OK, I thought I was depressed because I'm gay. You know what? I'm gay. It, it sort of inspired me i think to be who i am self-respect yeah yes dignity some people say that um the young gay men of today are that... so fucking lucky <laughs> is that what they say well do they well i say it and some of my older friends say it in general now are you happy as an older gay man oh yes what's life like it's wonderful you know because I, i'm able to be myself my only regret is that I wasn't able to be like that when I was younger. I want you to look at this young man now. Uh-huh. And if you could go back and say something to him now, what would you say to him? Darling, it only gets better. <laughs> Looking back, what would you say to him now? Just go ahead. Don't change anything, because at the end of the day, I've had a good life. If you dwell on the past, you've got no future. How do you feel when you look at him now? <sighs> I think you'll make it. I think you'll make it in life. You'll be okay. I think you have.
Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great guy. Thank you so much for your time.